This is the cradle of Western civilization. Mainland Greece on the west and Asia Minor on the east, and dozens of islands in between. The Aegean Sea links the inhabitants of this region, seafaring adventurers and their legends of gods and heroes. For thousands of years, fortune seekers and archaeologists have been searching these shores for evidence of the Trojan War. And now, some say they have found it. Today, not far off the pristine coast of the Aegean Sea, in what is now the modern country of Turkey, an international team is excavating what they believe to be the site of legendary Troy. They claim they're finding evidence of a five-acre city, complete with palace, streets, and a vibrant downtown. Outside the walls, they say they have evidence of a lower city. Ancient suburbs surrounded by a defensive moat built to prevent attacks by chariots, the ancient world's weapon of mass destruction. Manfred Korfman has been the director of the excavation since 1988. If you look around in this area, you see nothing. It's old fields, it's surface, but there was something in here. Here on this barren plain, Korfman and his colleagues envision a fortified city that rivals ancient Athens. Dating to the late Bronze Age, the prehistoric time of the Trojan War. But, as in all things Trojan, there is a conflict raging. Some think Korfman's finds are pure fantasy, as credible as the myth itself. Is this the site of ancient Troy? Did Troy actually exist? Why does its memory echo through time? I think the Trojan War is the original source of so many of our cultural expectations of soldiers, of literature, of human behavior, of the interplay between the divine and the mundane. So much of our cultural tradition originates in the Trojan War uh, that we continue to value it, even unconsciously, as a source of the archetypes upon which we model our behavior. History became a story and story became myth, and myth is always elusive. So now we're trying in a very strange way to go trace our steps backwards, which is not that easy. I mean, it's one thing to dress a history and make it story and then myth, and another thing to undress it. It takes much more pain and it's more dangerous. Although today some scholars have reservations about the existence of Troy, historians of the ancient world never doubted the Trojan War was history. Herodotus, Thucydides, and most other major figures of the Greek and Roman world assumed that the Trojan War was a historical fact. Here, on a beach not unlike that of Troy, Classics professor Robert Garland recounts the tale. Well, it all began with the gods, as things of great moment tended to in the ancient world, and it began with the wedding, wedding of Peleus and Thetis, destined incidentally to be the parents of Achilles, the greatest of the Greek warriors at Troy. And they invited all the celebrities of the ancient world, all the gods, all the goddesses, except one, they didn't think it was a very good idea to invite Discord. Discord shows up anyway. She offers a golden apple inscribed with the words, For the fairest. Three goddesses, Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite, claim the apple and ask Zeus to be the judge. He wisely declines and instead appoints Paris, the handsome prince of Troy. 
And as often happens, each of the contestants offered a bribe. The one he gave the prize to, Aphrodite, offered him the bribe of the most beautiful woman in the world. But there was one problem. That woman was married. She was Helen, married to Menelaus, king of Sparta. Paris sails for Sparta under the guise of official Trojan business. When Menelaus, his host, was absent, he eloped with Helen back to Troy and thus unleashed the fury that would become the Trojan War. Menelaus appealed to his brother Agamemnon, who was the overlord of the Greeks at that time. And Agamemnon summoned together all the Greek cities, all the kings, for a war of revenge to right the wrong that had been done to his brother. A thousand ships assemble, but the gods cause the winds to cease. To appease the gods, Agamemnon must make the ultimate sacrifice the ritual slaying of his own daughter. The winds blow, the fleet sails, and the war begins. The Greeks encamp around the walls of Troy, and for the next 10 long years, heroes are made and destroyed on the battlefield. Achilles, the celebrated Greek warrior, and Hector, the Trojan champion. As the war began to drag on in the 10th year, and it looked as if there was no end in sight. So the Greeks devised the ruse of the Trojan horse. The Greeks sailed off, and the Trojan horse was left outside the walls. The Trojans broke their walls down to let the horse enter, stuffed full as it was with Greek soldiers. And in the night, as the Trojans were celebrating, down came the Greeks out of the wooden horse, let in their companions, and proceeded to rape, pillage, and destroy. Many acts of vandalism were committed in that time. Priam was slaughtered at his own altar. Cassandra was raped. And the infant son of Hector was thrown from the walls of Troy, his brains dashed out. And even then, after Troy had been totally destroyed, the end was not in sight. As we know from the Odyssey, Odysseus was to wander for many years before he got home. Agamemnon returned to domestic turmoil. His wife, Clytemnestra, had been having an affair with her lover, and with him plotted the death of Agamemnon. So the homecoming of the Greeks was, for them, as devastating as was the destruction of Troy. How can such a fantastic story be true? The legend of Troy comes to us first from the oldest writings in Western civilization, the Iliad and the Odyssey, their authorship credited to the poet Homer. But Homer isn't born until five centuries after the war is thought to have occurred, and he is believed to have been blind and illiterate. Homer is our earliest witness for the Trojan War, and yet the Trojan War took place perhaps as many as 500 years before Homer's date. So how reliable can he possibly be? How can we trust this blind man's tale of lust and infidelity? Human sacrifice. Rape, blood, war, destruction, and the ultimate deceit. Is Homer's story the true story of Troy? It's the most legendary war in history. The first great story of Western civilization. For years, scholars believed it was only myth. But now, off the coast of the Aegean Sea, archaeologists claim to have discovered the remains of the ancient fortress city, Troy. Is Troy and the Trojan War history or myth? How can our best witness, a blind, illiterate poet named Homer, be trusted? 
This is the true story of Troy. Like Troy, what is known of Homer is a mixture of history and myth. Although he is credited as the author of Western civilization's first works of literature, the Iliad and the Odyssey, very little evidence of Homer exists. Some scholars estimate that he lived around 750 BC, and that the father of Greek literature was from a place not far from Troy. We think that he came from a region probably fairly close to Troy, perhaps from the city of Smyrna or from the island of Chios. But even this is doubtful. There's a strong tradition that he was blind, but other than that, virtually nothing can be said with any certainty about him. Two of the greatest mysteries about Homer concern how someone who lived 500 years after the Trojan War can recall such graphic details of battle and bloodshed. And how could one person, before the invention of Greek writing, remember more than 16,000 lines from the Iliad and 12,000 lines from the Odyssey? One possible answer is that Homer is a descendant of a lineage of singer-storytellers. If this is true, it means that the Iliad and Odyssey were not written by a Homer, but were passed down by many Homers. It's perfectly possible that singers immediately began to sing about this famous conflict, that it was passed on from one generation to the next, uh, not, not, not with any attention to historical accuracy in which no one had any interest. All the details and all the fancy stuff and the, and the woman running away and Achilles and Hector and the, and, the, and the Trojan horse, all this stuff was generated by singers over the ages. Their contributions to the story were inherited by Homer and he added his own twist to it. But if Homer is the last in a lineage of oral poets, how does the story of Troy transform from a memorized song to the first written story of Western civilization. In the 1930s, an American scholar by the name of Milman Parry, equipped with some of the first portable sound recording devices, discovers a way to return to a time when all of history was a song. Parry treks to old world Balkan villages in Serbia and discovers singers who, just like Homer, sing epic songs of ancient battles and heroes. Perry made recordings on aluminum discs and on aluminum wire uh, of these songs, and he also took down these songs by dictation. Perry discovered a very interesting thing, that when you write down uh, an oral poem, it tends to get much longer than when you just sing it in a public performance. For over a year, Perry investigates the oral tradition, transcribing and recording many songs, some as long as Homer's. Parry finds that memory of historical events can be passed on for long periods of time and still remain accurate. The Serbian bards sing about the Battle of Kosovo, which had taken place in the 14th century. Amazingly, written accounts of heroes battling invaders confirm these 600-year-old songs to be true. <laughs> 